Okay, yesterday we talked about the altitude that was coming down the center of this triangle um, from this right angle D being the geometric mean, okay? Today we're going to talk about the legs of the right triangle being the geometric mean. Um, but those legs, leg AD is still an altitude because the, because the overall triangle is a right triangle. And the legs of a right triangle are, by definition, altitudes, okay? So every one of the relationships that we create, what is going to go in the geometric mean location will always be an altitude. Does that make sense? Okay, but it... it for for some people, it makes sense, or it's it's easier to visualize that AD is a leg versus it being an altitude. But they are both those things. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so I'm looking at leg AD. That's going to go there and there. But then it says when the altitude is drawn to the hypotenuse of a right triangle, each leg is the geometric mean between the hypotenuse. So when, when it says the hypotenuse, now there are three right triangles up there. When it says the hypotenuse, it's talking about the hypotenuse, the biggest hypotenuse, okay, which would be the hypotenuse of the overall triangle, okay? So what would be the hypotenuse of the overall triangle ADC? It'd be AC, Okay, you said A, B, C, and that's fine. Uh, but A to C would be the entire hypotenuse because that's across from that right angle, right? And that right angle is established for the overall triangle. Okay, so A, C then is that hypotenuse. A lot of people want to say D, C. D, C is an out or is a hypotenuse, okay? But it's a hypotenuse for that triangle, not the overall triangle. Does that make sense? Okay. So we need to go to the largest hypotenuse that's here, which is going to be the hypotenuse for the overall triangle. So it says it's be the geometric mean between the hypotenuse and now the segment of the hypotenuse that is adjacent, which means touching or shares an endpoint with the leg that we used. So we used leg AD, right? So there's leg AD. We just identified the hypotenuse as that segment right there, correct? AC. Now, is there a portion of that hypotenuse that touches AD? Because when we, when we look at that hypotenuse, because of this point B right here, we have this portion of the hypotenuse and we have this yellow portion of the hypotenuse. Which portion, the purple or the yellow, touches this leg that we used as the geometric mean? It's just the purple one, right? The purple one touches the blue one at A. So then A, B goes right there. It's frustrating. There you go. A, B. All right, so the way I remember this, because okay, every problem that we come across is going to be a little bit different because the letters are different. So I try not to learn this with letters, okay? I learn this with like a phrase, I'm gonna put, a leg there, a leg there, it's the same leg. I'm gonna say overall, hypotenuse goes there, and then part, of hypotenuse touching leg goes there. It's a little bit wordier, 
And that's the reason why textbooks don't write that kind of proportion out uh, because of the wordy aspect. They'd rather um, give a picture, label things, and then use those arbitrary labels. Um, but this thing here in red says exactly the same thing that this here says. Okay. However, when we do this, if that's the case, if we're using a leg in the geometric mean position, there are two legs for this overall triangle. One leg was AD, the other leg is CD. So we can put CD there and there. And now going through the corollary again, okay, that leg is the geometric mean between the hypotenuse. So there again is the hypotenuse, so it's still AC. But now, what portion of that blue segment, either the green portion or the purple portion, which portion touches this leg that we used as the geometric mean? The purple, right? That makes sense to everybody? So the purple is segment BC. But that again is using that same exact proportion there. All right, so when we, so like I said, we're going to come across different problems that have different letters for vertices and that kind of thing. Um, so we've got, ultimately, there's going to be three different proportions you can write, but those three only follow two structures, okay? Uh, this first structure, the one we just talked about using a leg, okay? Uh, the only thing that changes ultimately is that those two things are going to change what leg we're using, and then this part here will be a little bit different. But the structure for whether I use leg CR or leg RS will be the same. The other format is what we talked about yesterday, and that's when we use this interior altitude as the geometric mean. Okay, And then when we use the interior altitude as the geometric mean, then the parts that go in the extremes location are the two separate parts of the hypotenuse that that interior altitude creates. Okay, so remember, and that, that's something to think about here. When I say leg of a right triangle, that is also an altitude. But when I say altitude of a right triangle, that is not always the leg. Does that make sense? Because this is an altitude of a right triangle, but it's not a leg. Okay, uh, this is a leg of a right triangle, and it is an altitude. This is the leg of the right triangle, and it is an altitude. Okay. Um, so in this, this scenario here, when it says when altitude is the geometric mean, to clear things up, let's, let's talk about the interior altitude. Okay. So if I want the interior altitude to be the geometric mean, that would be Rx. So I'll put Rx here, Rx there. Okay. Now, this is that T shape that I showed you yesterday. If that is the altitude I'm looking at, that creates two parts of the hypotenuse down here. Those two parts are what goes in the remaining positions in the um, proportion. So CX can go there. And XS 
can go there. And because of the, uh, our rules about proportions and generating equivalent proportions, uh, those can switch spots. Okay, those don't have. They could be XS and CX. Um, we can actually look at reciprocals of this stuff, and it would still be true. But this is the most, I think, direct way of generating uh, a accurate and workable proportion. The next one says RS is going to be your geometric mean. So RS there and RS there. I want to highlight that segment, which now that is a leg, correct? So now when we're using the legs as the geometric mean, we, we need to identify what is the entire hypotenuse. So when I look at this right triangle, what is the hypotenuse of that right triangle? CS. Okay, that is the entire hypotenuse right there. Okay, now there's two parts of that. There's that part CX, and there's that part XS. Which part touches the purple? XS. And now we do the exact same thing, except for looking at the other leg. So the other leg is CR. And now I'm just going to highlight CR as my leg. Now, what goes in this position is the hypotenuse. So what's the entire hypotenuse again? CS. And what goes down here then? What part of that hypotenuse touches the purple segment? CX. Okay, so if we can, every single problem we come across, eventually we're going to generate those three proportions. Okay, um, some of these problems here that we have as examples, um, may not directly say, you know, I think what a lot of students will get to is they'll say, okay, X is alphabetical before Y. So what they'll do is they'll say, I'm going to solve for X first. You might not be able to do that. You might be able to set up a proportion for X, but you might not be able to solve for X until you know what Y is. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so my thought is as we do these problems, okay, they're all going to be very similar, you're going to set up these three proportions before you try to do any algebra. Okay. So accomplish the geometry aspect of the problems, and then rely on your algebra. Okay, so let's come down to this example here. And I'm actually going to add in another variable here. Let's call this distance Z, and we'll find all values X, Y, and Z. Yes, Maddie? All right, so what I like to do, I like to visualize, I'm always going to, and it, early on, and you get in the habit of this, because a lot of times they ask this question. These are the parts, these things that I highlight here. Those are the legs and the altitude, the interior altitude of that right triangle PRQ. Okay. Those things I just highlighted are going to be the things that are all geometric means. Does that make sense? In this problem, our geometric means are always variable in this problem, this specific one. That doesn't have to be the case, though. In some of the problems we do, the geometric mean, that Y value, it might be a number. Z might be a number. Does that make sense? Okay. It does not have to be a variable. I think a lot of people, through my experience with them, is that they think that in these spots right here, you always need a variable. You don't. Okay? Uh, the variable can show up anywhere in the uh, proportions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, I, I just think, I'm, it's because it's, I think it's the easier one to think about, I always look at this interior altitude first, and I deal with it. So that interior altitude should be the geometric means. It goes there and there. 
Now, when we do that, when we look at that interior altitude, doesn't it break up into that T picture right there? Takes the hypotenuse and, and divides it into two parts. So the interior altitude Z is then compared to these two parts of two and four. So two will go here and four will go there. Okay? And that's the first corollary that we talked about in the video on Friday. Talked about again on Monday. Now we're going to do the same thing, but now we're going to look at one of the other um, segments. We're going to use now the, let's look at this leg Y first. Okay, so if that's a leg, legs are geometric means, so it goes there and there. Now, it's the geometric mean between the hypotenuse. What's the hypotenuse of this overall right triangle? It's that distance right there, which is 6. So 6 will go here. Okay. And now what part of that hypotenuse, what part of that green segment is touching the blue segment? 2. So 2 will go there. And now we'll play the same game with X. X is a leg, so that's again a geometric mean, there and there. And now, what is the entire hypotenuse for this right triangle? Be our 6, right? And what part of that 6, then, what part of the hypotenuse is touching the blue leg? Be the 4. Is that okay with everybody? So that's the geometry. If you can do that, you've done everything that I've tried to teach you. Okay? Now we need to rely on our algebra skills and this is where because of the end of last year and how, how all that worked out we might be struggling in this next aspect so we're gonna when we see questions like this we'll slow down with the algebra make sure we're all fully understanding of the concepts I sent you out an email this morning uh, it's like a 15 minute video it's not me but it's a uh, an individual that I think does a good job of explaining how to do some math concepts um, he talks about how it's, it's the most rudimentary basic procedure for simplifying radicals. He talks about how to do it, okay? Um, I don't know if he, he gets into a whole lot of, like, theory behind it and what we're doing, uh, but he shows you how to do it, and you can be kind of robotic. I like to talk about how not only can we, how we do it, but why we do it, okay? Um, when we simplify a radical, the goal is, you know, think about what we do when we simplify fractions. When I simplify two-fourths, what am I really doing? Okay, I'm making it go down to one-half, but I'm recognizing that that four is two times two, right? So I'm looking for those factors that are in common on top and bottom that ultimately cancel out, right? Okay, that produce a quotient of 1 for us. When we do a square root, there's a similar thing occurring. Okay, if I want to take the square root of, let's say, 18. Okay, that is a symbol for another number. Okay, I think we talked about this a little bit um, maybe last week, but square root of 18 is actually a symbol for that number right there, okay? And when we do square roots, and it's really any types of roots, there's actually an understood 2 out here in front, okay? That number is referred to as an index, 
it basically tells us that once you get this value here, that is how many times you take that highlighted value and multiply it by itself to get the 18. Does that make sense? Okay, so radical 18 or square root of 18 here is standing in for this number here, okay? Now, this number here actually goes, it's an irrational number. It's like pi. It goes on forever. It never terminates and it never repeats. For that reason, we never write it this way. Because once I write it this way, even though Desmos goes out to, you know, 10 decimal place precision, that is not radical 18. Does that make sense? It's a good estimate of it. But radical 18, if you started writing it down as a decimal, you would die writing it down. Okay, if you were right, right down just until you died, you would not be done writing the decimal portion out. Does that make sense? If somebody picked your pencil up and kept writing them after that, they would die. And if every single person in the population of the world, in the history of the world, did that, and they all died, once the last person that ever lived died, you would still not have radical 18 written out as a decimal. It's impossible to write it out. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so we have to have symbols for those types of things, and that's the symbol to represent that number that we cannot write out. Okay. Now, Desmos does a good job of rounding here, and we can actually still demonstrate that that number, even though it's not the exact value for radical 18, multiplied by itself, even though that's not the exact value for radical 18, still gives me 18. That makes sense? Okay. Um, however, when we want to simplify, there is a number inside 18. 18 is composite, right? Meaning that 18 can be rewritten as 2 times 2. I'm oh, sorry, not 2 times 2 times 3 times 3. It can be written as a product of prime numbers. Every composite number can be written that way. Okay. No matter what number you give me, as long as it's not prime, I should be able to break it down to a product of primes. Okay. Well, right here, isn't that the same thing as 2 times, you can write it two different ways, 3 squared or 2 times 9. You guys agree with that? Okay. Well, if I'm looking at the square root of 18, that means I should be having the square root of 2 times 3 times 3 underneath instead of the square root of 18. Does that make sense? Is that number still, is that 4.24 number the same there as it is down here? Okay. Well, that means I can write the square root then as 2 times 3 squared. Does that make sense? Or you can write it as the square root of 2 times 9, however you want to write that 3 squared. Okay? Is everybody okay with this so far? The, prod, the, the square root of a product, this is a square root of a product, correct? Is equivalent to the product of square roots. So 2 times 9 is underneath this radical all by itself, right? I can actually separate them and put them in their own radicals. Still get the same thing. Laws of exponents allow me to do that. Okay. Some of you might write it as square root of 2 times square root of 3 squared. I like writing it that way because what is the square root of something squared? Yeah, it's just, that's, it's just that something. That and that, can't, they're inverses. They cancel each other out. So it leaves me with just a 3. Does that make sense? Okay. Or if you write it this way, as the radical 9, what's the square root of 9? 3, right? Okay. Do you guys see that this 9 here is a perfect square? Whether I write it as 3 squared or I write it as 9, it's a perfect square that divided 18. Okay, so when we're simplifying radical 18, what we're really doing is trying to find the largest perfect square, the largest perfect square that divides 18. Well, 9 is that number. If I take the square root of 9, I get 3. Okay, take 18 divided by 9, it leaves you with 2. So I have a square root of 2 being left over. Is 3 radical 2 still the exact same thing as what the square root of 18 was? 
We prefer 3 Radical 2 over Radical 18. That's referred to as a simplified version. Because now there is no longer, and that rat, we call that the radicand, there is no perfect square that will divide 2 because 2 is prime. Okay? So, that's what we're doing. We're trying to find... We're trying to find the largest perfect square that divides our radicand. We talked yesterday, did an example, said one of those procedures that will always generate this for you is to take your, your radicand and you start finding factors for it, okay? You know, there's, there's a lot of factors for 18. Two and nine work, but doesn't three and six work as well? It doesn't matter which route you go. Okay, if I'm a person that likes to go three and six, that's fine. Three is prime, right? So I'm going to stop with that number. Six is composite, so I'm going to rewrite that as two times three. Those are both prime. Okay, now yesterday I said, when you do this, once you get all your branches of your factor tree to be prime, you look for groups of two or pairs of two like factors. So here's a pair of threes, correct? And the reason I'm looking for pairs is because that index out front was a two. It's telling me to look for two. Looking for perfect squares, essentially. If it was a three, we'd be looking for groups of three. If it was a four, groups of four, that kind of thing. Okay? But that right there, that three times three, essentially, is the nine that is the perfect square that divides 18. Does that make sense? Okay? So you'll see me write this several different ways. We can kind of do what I did there on Desmos and say, okay, well, 18, radical 18 is now the same thing as 3 squared times 2. I can break that down to radical 3 squared times radical 2. Those cancel, leave me 3 radical 2. A lot of times, even if you watch the video, I think the guy in the video says, once you find a group of 3s, one of those numbers comes out of the radical and you ignore the other one. And then the things that don't have groups, like this two, stays underneath. Okay? And I think that structure, that teaching, is a kind of robotic or calculator type process. When I say, when you find a group of threes, that one of those comes out, do we really know what we're doing there? Why is that coming out? It's because that group of threes is actually the number nine, as a product underneath the square root, and that square root of 9 is a 3. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, so that's the logic and the kind of underpinning uh, procedures and uh, concepts that we go through when we're simplifying radicals. Okay. My suggestion to you, obviously, if you ignore them, they're going to be difficult. Okay. Uh, I, I get that initially they're hard because it's something that we haven't spent a whole lot of time on up until this year. Um, but let me draw your attention to, because I always think this is important. Um, this chapter right here, chapter 8, radicals there, radicals there, more radicals, more radicals. Chapter 8, all the way through, uses radicals, okay? When we get to Chapter 10 and 11, we start talking about area and surface areas. Those are going to, even though we're not specifically talking about what we did in Chapter 8, in order to find measurements for area and measurements for distance and volume and that kind of stuff in Chapters 9 or Chapters 10, 11, and 12, they're going to use things from chapter 8 to give you dimensions. And chapter 8 uses radicals, so I'm trying to get at 10, 11, 12, I'm going to use radicals. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, when you get into trigonometry, that's all, you know, we've, we've, we're doing radicals every day in trig. Okay. Uh, they're not something that is extremely difficult after you force yourself to work with them. Okay. Um, but if, you, if, they, if you're fearful of them, you don't see the success that you want right away, and you ignore them, you're never going to get good at them. Okay? So just keep that in mind. Going back now and solving this problem, okay, if I cross multiply, 
we get z squared equals 8, correct? How, because this is z squared and there's no linear factor here, meaning there's no z to the first, we can use square roots to solve for z. So I'm going to take the square root of this side, square root of that side. Does that make sense? Okay, that's, those are, that's doing an inverse operation. When you introduce a radical, when you bring the square root, and it's an, an even root, so if we do this with square roots or fourth roots or sixth roots later on in another algebra concept, it's a plus or minus radical 8. Okay, when you introduce the radical, you have to put a plus or minus there. The reason you have to do that is because, remember, this symbol represents another number that when I multiply it by itself, it gives me 8. Multiply it by itself twice, it gives me 8. Okay? Think about if that number, we'll just make an easy one. Let's say that we had, like, z was equal to plus or minus radical 25. Okay, what number can I multiply by itself two times to get 25? 5, and that would be the positive version, right? But doesn't negative 5 times negative 5 also give me 25? So that's why we've got the negative one, okay? Because we're multiplying something twice. We're squaring something, essentially. And whenever you square something, you get a positive version of that value. We have to have this concept here, okay? So when you put the square root and you introduce it, it's plus or minus, okay? Um, and I say that because there will be questions later on. Like if I have 3 plus radical x equals 12, I get this question all the time in my college algebra classes. They're like, is this a plus or minus x? Well, if the problem started with this, then it's just what they say it is. It's positive there. Does that make sense? Okay, because you didn't introduce it. But if you introduce it, you've got to have the plus or minus. So I get radical 8 here. Plus or minus radical 8. Now, that's not simplified. Is there, is there a perfect square that divides 8? 4, right? So I'm gonna, I can rewrite this as radical 4 times radical 2. That 2 is what I get when I take 8 and divide it by 4, right? That's why I get that other factor. But what's the square root of 4? 2. That's the way I like it, and I prefer to do these problems, okay, when I'm simplifying. But if you're a person that says... We'll take radical 8, we'll break it down to 2 and 4, and then we'll take 4 and break it down to 2 and 2, and then say, okay, there is a pair of 2s that can come out of the radical, and then that 2 doesn't have a pair, so it stays underneath the radical. Does it still give me 2 radical 2? Yeah. Okay. But this proceed. this is called an algorithm, okay? This algorithm, which is just basically a... An algorithm is like a, uh, a set of directions that tell you to do something repetitively. And ultimately, in those directions, there's either there's a stop command or a continue command. So basically what we're saying here is we've got an algorithm that says factor 8 until you get a prime number and then stop with that prime number. Okay? So I take 8, factored it, got 2, that's a prime number, I stopped there. It also gave me the factor of 4. 4 is not prime, so I keep that algorithm going and say, okay, now I'm going to divide 4 until I get all prime numbers. Take 4 divided by 2, 2 is prime. I get this result here of another factor of 2, that's prime, so I stop the algorithm. Okay? If you go that route, that's fine, but make sure that you understand that when we circle those right there, that's because we were, that is effectively finding that largest perfect square that divides 8. Okay, so 2 radical 2 would be that distance that we're looking for. Now, it's plus or minus, right? But what does z represent? z was this distance here, right? Do distances have to be a special type of number? They have to be positive. Okay, so that's why I got rid of that negative in my answer. One of the things that you find out in, and, and I think this is, Due to the fact that we go Algebra 1, Geometry, and then Algebra 2, when you get to Algebra 2 and you work with uh, root equations or radical equations, a lot of you will initially 
get some questions wrong because you forget that there's two solutions. There's a positive radical two or two radical two and a negative two radical two. The reason you get it wrong is because you've been trained in this class that usually when we're doing this, we're looking at a distance, right? When we're using radicals, we're usually using distances, and distances always have to be positive, right? So we just n are negligent of that negative for the fact that this, this is always attached to a distance. When you get to Algebra 2, it's not attached to a distance, and you need to have both answers. Does that make sense? So just be on the lookout for that. This next one. Cross multiply, we get y squared equals 12, right? Square root both sides. Okay, I get square root of 12. Now, what is the perfect square that divides 12? Okay, so, so the perfect square would be 4, though, right? And then that radical 4 changes into 2. If you're a person that says, I need to take 12 and go 2 and 6, and then two and three, you can see your group of twos come out. Your three stays underneath. And then the last one, we get x squared equals 24. What's the largest perfect square that divides 24? The largest perfect square should be four, though, right? Square root of four is... Two, so we get two, two radical six, or two root six. If we did 24, it goes two and 12, two and six, two and three, right? And this one's a little bit different the way we break our factor tree down. We get a group of twos, so those come out as that two right there, right? Now this two and that three, they do not have things to group up and come out of the radical with. Does that make sense? So if they can't come out of the radical, they become a group together. You multiply two and three together, and it gives you that six underneath. All right. If you're ever struggling with whether you have correctly simplified something. Now, it doesn't tell you you've fully simplified it. But if I have square root of 24 as that number there, and I type in two square root of six, it gives me the same decimal does that tell me that these two things are equal formats? It does not tell me, though, that that number right there was fully simplified. Okay, it just tells me I've got an equivalent um, answer. Is that all right, everybody? Why don't you guys take the next, give about five or six minutes here, see what you can come up with on this next example. We'll call that X. We'll call that Z, and we'll call that Y. Setting up the geometry, do we get those three ratios, or proportions, I guess, sorry? Z, the interior altitude should go between 2 and 6. X is a leg, so that goes between the entire hypotenuse, which is 8. And the part of the hypotenuse of touching X, which would be 2. And then Y is the same idea. It's a leg, so the entire hypotenuse is 8. And now the part of that hypotenuse of touching that leg of Y is 6. Cross multiply, we get Z squared equals 12. Okay, we've already done that one up here. That was 2 radical 3, right? 2 radical 3. Here we get X squared equals 16. What kind of number is 16? perfect square, meaning that when I take the square root of it, I get an integer back, right? Okay. Uh, which means so that those are the only square roots that terminate or end, uh, meaning like radical 16, if I wrote it that way, that's not irrational. That's a rational number. It's just in a format that it we don't see it being rational right off the bat. Okay, I have to simplify it first. Uh, and then if I look at this next one, y squared equals, I'm a, I'm a fan of going 8 times 6. We could do this two different ways. Um, but I, I see this because I know 6 doesn't have a perfect square that divides it. Does that make sense? I know that 8 does, though. I know that 8 goes to 2 radical 2. Okay, so if I square root this side, square root this side, 8 
goes to 2, radical 2, and the 6 stays as radical 6. Okay? But now that 6 I also know is this. That 6 can be rewritten as 2 times 3, correct? What's radical 2 times radical 2? Radical 4, which is... At the first square, so it just gives me 2, right? So that right there is actually a 2. And I've got this 2 out front already, so I've got 4 radical 3. That's the way I like to do it. It makes sense for me. It makes things go faster for me. I can do more mental math that way. If you're not that way, and you go 8 times 6 and say, okay, well, that's 48. 48 goes to the 2 and 4. Or think about this. If that's 48, doesn't it go to 8 and 6? That's how we generate it, right? 8 goes to 4 and 2. 2 and 2. 6 goes to 2 and 3. There's a group of twos that can come out in front. There's a group of twos that can come out in front. And anything that comes out in front gets multiplied by anything that's already there or anything else that comes out with it. So that two comes out. That two comes out. They multiply together. They give you four. This three cannot come out, so it stays underneath. So radical 48 is the same thing as four radical three. A way to check yourself is if I – and this is the idea that we were taking out the largest favorite square. If you square that number, what's 4 squared? 16. What's 16 times 3? 48. It gets you back to the number you started with. Okay? All of those do that. If you take 2 and square it, what do you get when you take 2 and square it? 4 multiplied by 3, what's that give you? The 12 you started with. Okay? We good on this? Yeah. All right. All right. So tomorrow, so I'm going to go slow. This is, so, so tomorrow, um, we're going to finish these examples. There's a couple on here. This one's challenging. Um, towards the end, this one might have some challenge to it. Uh, but we'll finish these examples, uh, and you should have a little bit of time to work on your homework. Um, but that, ra that simplifying radical procedure, guys, that is, that is of the utmost importance. And, and in my honest opinion, are you going to use this geometry very often? Probably not. Okay. But the radical work, you're going to use that a lot. Okay. Um, now, are you going to use it outside of school? I doubt it. Okay. Um, but you're going to use it in all of your math classes from here on. So whenever you graduate from taking math, whether it be in high school or college. Yes, I'm, I'm going to open up um, a second assignment for 7.4, uh, but it's, it's not going to be due until, what is today? Tuesday, so it'll be, it'll be due at least Thursday night. That, that'd be the earliest. Um, we've got this section and one more section, so we're getting close.